So how can we use LIDAR for hydrological modeling? I already mentioned uh, HIUs, or Hydrological Response Unit uh, Generation. Um, I think we've discussed uh, clearly the geometric attributes of watersheds and the and channels. Uh, uh, they're obvious um, inputs into any kind of hydrological modeling strategy. We, we, we need to know how big our watershed is. Uh, we need to know where uh, sub-basins are and those, that kind of information. Well, that all comes from the watershed process, but that's important for hydrological modeling. We can utilize the point cloud to help with land cover classification. So the most simple case would be, is this canopy covered or not canopy covered? And, uh, or how canopy covered? Um, how dense is the forestry? Uh, what kind of uh, land covers? Uh, what kind of crops are on there? We can use that three-dimensional information in tandem with other uh, optical data sources to get very good classifications. And Laura, I think, uh, illustrated quite a bit of that yesterday. So we can take this information to help with our HIU um, categorization for the watershed. And each one of those different HIUs is going to have a set of hydrological parameters associated with it. Uh, other areas that we can, uh, where we can utilize the LIDAR very directly is in terms of uh, modeling turbulent and radiant fluxes, so for like shortwave radiation modeling or for aerodynamic resistance modeling. And I'll illustrate a couple of those. So, for example, here we have a, a radiation modeling, uh, well, so the systems model for a radiation model as implemented in a, in a GIS. Uh, so, if we run this through time, um, we can generate models that look like this. Um, actually, when we did this, we thought we were quite smart, but actually, it's very easy to do this in ArcGIS now. Although we did it before ArcGIS implemented it, just so you know. Um, we can also uh, utilize the um, kind of roughness information contained within the point cloud uh, to come up with uh, indices of aerodynamic roughness. I guess one of the standard indices of uh, roughness uh, or measures of roughness is Z0, or the zero plane of dis displacement. And so we developed a method. This, this was in Australia working with CSIRO. Um, we developed a, a method um, to uh, filter the, uh, the canopy height model uh, in a way, uh, well, the algorithm is there, um, to uh, give us a, a two-dimensional map of roughness across the landscape. And uh, the reason we needed to do that is because uh, one relatively traditional way to parameterize roughness or zero plane of displacement was simply to use a um, calculated as an estimate of height, of canopy height, uh, which is okay if you're right in the middle of a canopy but it's not okay at the edges of canopies or at the edges of forest stands or the edges of any kind of linear feature. So we tried to um, further refine that approach uh, to account for that. And while we haven't yet validated this particular model, we have used this approach in uh, footprint models and found that it gives better results. So this is something that we're continuing to uh, develop. And of course, radiative transfer. Uh, we just illustrated um, how you can map uh, shortwave radiation across the landscape. Uh, if you've got canopy information, if, if uh, from your uh, canopy point cloud, you can parameterize gap fraction, uh, transmittance, leaf error index, and so on and so forth. You can start to uh, use that information to map <coughs> the uh, the amount of radiation that actually makes it to the ground uh, underneath the canopy. So we've done a, a little bit of work on that too. So hydraulic modeling applications, this is probably uh, quite pertinent right now with um, flooding being high on everyone's minds in this part of the world. There are standard workflows for flood modeling. Um, we have a, uh, uh, where do we start? I guess, um, you know what, let's not worry about that workflow. <laughs> let's just get straight into the data. Here's our uh, floodplain and the old man again. We looked at this yesterday. And we looked at this yesterday. We can extract cross sections, as you can see here. Um, we can maybe assume some bathymetric information. Maybe we've actually done a bathymetric survey and we're integrating that with the uh, cross sections. And then we use this information as input. Um, oh, sorry, we, we calculate lots and lots of cross sections, and we use those cross sections within our hydraulic modeling database as the framework uh, to route water through the landscape and calculate flood levels. One thing you'll notice here is that 
when we're setting up these cross sections in a hydraulic model, we need to define the edge of the bank. You know, we've got all of these points on the uh, uh, on our floodplain, but we need to tell this uh, the database which of these points are actually our bank edges. And so, in this example, uh, I'd suggest maybe we choose that point, and uh, maybe that point as being our, our bank location. Uh, usually, the, the, that ba the bank is some kind of obvious break point. You know, the, usually the channel or the river is rooted within the bank, and you know we all understand what it means to hold the bank, hold the top of the bank. There's very often some kind of a natural levy that occurs at the, at the, at the bank edge. So, what we can uh, do in some cases is we can use this, uh, you know, use profiles of the lidar data across channels to identify where these banks occur. Now, it's very easy to do manually. It's very easy to look at the cross-sections. Okay, well, there's the bank. And, and here's, this is what constrains our channel. But, of course, the idea is if you're looking at a large landscape and there's lots of uh, channels, you would like to be able to do that in some automated fashion. And so one way to do that is to use the uh, steep slope criteria in an, an adaptive thresholding technique where you take the slope information. In this case, you kind of smooth or filter the slope information and then you merge it back with the cross-section and you create these characteristic uh, edge artifacts and then you can map these edge artifacts and they kind of define the channel for you. And, uh, and it's a somewhat automated approach. It, it requires cleaning, it does require some manual intervention, but it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. And so this is what you end up with is a map that looks something like this. Uh, if we go back very briefly to our cross-section, now another one of the parameters we need to attribute this cross-section with is roughness. As I mentioned yesterday, we can either map the obstruction features in that landscape and come up with some kind of quasi-physical estimate of, uh, of roughness, or we can develop a kind of a classification-based lookup table approach where we just say, well, this kind of land cover um, would have a Manning's N of, you know, whatever it says in the lookup table, and this land cover would have a Manning's N of something different, and we get that land cover information from the, from the classification that we've derived from the, from the LIDAR and, and or optical data. And so this is what everything would look like when it's all put together. We've got all these cross sections, we can route our water through there, and, uh, you know, this may or may not be LIDAR. Well, I know this is LIDAR because one of my students put this together. Um, we also know it's LIDAR because there's lots and lots and lots of cross sections through there. That's the really cool thing about having the DEM, having such a highly resolution ac accurate DEM, is that we can, we're can we unbounded by the number of cross sections that we would like to put in there. Um, typically, if you send a field through out there to extract your cross sections, you're not going to be doing cross sections every 10 meters. It would just cost too much, take too long. You wouldn't be able to do that. But there's no reason why you wouldn't do that if you've got a LiDAR-based cross-section. The only thing where there's uncertainty, of course, is that bathymetric component. So you could maybe do a proper bathymetric survey every kilometer or 500 meters, 200 meters, whatever you deem appropriate, and then maybe interpolate uh, the rest of the, that part of the profile. And so that's what uh, can result from this approach. You can. Uh, do some uh, flood run flood inundation scenarios. So here you can see flood depth across the landscape. 